Commissioner, the next witness is Mr. Pankhurst. Yes, is Mr. Pankhurst in the hearing room. I think he might be outside, Commissioner. If we can send for him, please. Pankhurst, if you'd be good enough to come into the witness box and before you sit down, if I could ask you whether you'd prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation. I'll be sworn. Yes, Please. can you swear the witness, please? Please repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. So the evidence I shall give. Just a moment. Just a moment. Just a moment. <clears throat> Would you be good enough, please, not to move it round while the oath is being administered? It is, I thought, still regarded as common courtesy to the witness more than anyone. Perhaps you could begin to administer the oath again, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. But, and nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr Pankhurst. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Sir, is your full name Mark James Pankhurst? Uh, yes. And are you the Head of Superannuation, Pensions and Investments for ANZ Wealth? Uh, yes. Is your business address 833 Collins Street, Docklands, Victoria? Yes. Have you received a summons to attend to give evidence to this Commission? I have. Do you have the original of that summons uh, in front of you? I have. I tender the summons, Commissioner. Summons to Mr Pankhurst, Exhibit 5.255. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Pankhurst, you've made, have you not, two statements um, in relation to evidence to this Commission? I have. The first dated the 1st of August 2018. Uh, that is correct. And the second dated the 14th of August 2018? Uh, that is correct. Now, now, in paragraphs 10 and 11 of your second statement, Mr Pankhurst, you have made, have you not, two changes or two corrections to your first statement? That is correct. Now, with those changes, is your first statement true and correct? Uh, that is correct. I tend to that statement and its exhibits. Exhibit 5.256, the statement of 1 August 18 and its exhibits. And in relation to your statement of the 14th of August 2018, is that true and correct? Uh, that is correct. I tend to that statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.257, the statement of 14 August. May I please, Commissioner? Thank you. Yes, Mr Hart. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Pankhurst, I'd like to deal with two topics with you. The first is in relation to payments made by responsible entities of managed investment schemes to the ANZ group. And you've addressed some questions about that in your statement. Certainly. So you might just need to speak up. Certainly. So if we could bring up your statement, which is ANZ.999.019.0001, and go to page dot double zero seven three. You see you say in paragraph one hundred and fifty seven of your statement that you're informed that one path custodians and oasis have not formally considered these types of payments? That's correct. And the types of payments we're talking about are payments made by responsible entities of managed investment schemes to some member of the group where the payment is calculated by reference to investments made out of the super fund. Uh, that's correct. And you say you're informed that to the extent that one Path Life or Oasis retain the benefit of such payments. One Path Custodians and Oasis consider that it is appropriate to do so where this is a major consideration by management 
in setting the pricing position of fees within products charged to members of the fund? That is correct. And then you say such payments are a major consideration by management in determining the pricing position of fees? That's correct. And you may not be aware of this, but has has this position very recently changed only in one respect, which is that the board of One Path Custodians and Oasis has recently turned its mind since receipt of the rubric from the Commission to exactly what is going on in relation to these payments? Uh, yes, I was made aware this afternoon. I see. And perhaps if we bring back up ANZ.801.098.2251. So these are the draft minutes, Commissioner, that were just tendered. Yes. And if we go to page dot two two five six, we see item nine, which is a consideration of shelf space fees. I do. And shelf space fees is another way of referring to the types of payments that I'm referring to. That is correct. And you see there was a presentation made to the board. That's correct. And was the first time you were made aware of this this afternoon, is that right? That's correct. Just before you were giving evidence? That's correct. Okay. And what was explained what there was that management's understanding is that shelf space fees are factored into the calculation of fees by One Path Life? I'm, I'm sorry, do you mean in that board meeting? Yes. You're not sure? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, are you aware or have you had the opportunity to make any inquiries about what the outcome was of the board meeting? Uh, no, I haven't, but, but I was shown a, a diagram. You were shown a diagram? I was shown a, a diagram of a... Oh, I see. A, ..of a, um, a, a flow chart, if you like. But I, I don't know what the outcome of the conversation was. It was just that I was shown that. Okay. Maybe if we can just check if we're referring, or I understand what you're referring to. Can we bring up ANZ.801.039.0039? So this is the first page of the document, and then if we go to the second page. Is this the diagram that you're referring to? That's correct. Okay. Explaining how it is in the case of one path that these that the money flows through from an external MIS. I, I think it was attempting to do that, but I don't believe that it's correct. You don't think it's accurate? No, I don't. Could you just explain to the Commissioner so that when we come to look at this afterwards, we know what the problems are, why it is incorrect? Well, I've only had a very scant look at it, so... Um, I, I quickly spoke with uh, the person who informed me uh, in regards to the way that flows work for uh, RPS, and my understanding is that they, the flows that have um, been diagram diagrammatically drawn there that go from the particular investment manager, so Schroeder's investment management there, they don't f flow through one path funds management at all. Um, my understanding is that there is a, a different pathway. And so um, I would probably want to understand a little bit more about the thinking and the context as to why this diagram was proposed, because I'm, I'm not sure as, as to that before I, I comment too much further. I see. You're saying you're not sure that the money flow is going from the responsible entity of the external managed investment scheme through to one path funds management. Uh, in, in the RPS situation, I know how the um, One Path um, Master Fund works. Yes. Um, I'm very clear on those arrangements, but I would need to understand the context in which they were talking, whether that was a historical arrangement, whether that was a, a future arrangement. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not clear of that context, unfortunately, so I'm struggling a little bit with trying to understand the, the way that they've, they've drawn it, because it just doesn't, it didn't look correct to me. And when I spoke with my peer, 
uh, he made similar mention that that was the case and he also hadn't been aware of the document as well. Do you know whether the board has requested further information to understand exactly what's going on in relation to these payments? It would be a, a, based on what you've just explained to me and what I learnt this afternoon. I, I, that's what I believe to be the case. Right. I tend to the document, Commissioner. One path shelf space flows, uh, ANZ 8010390039. Exhibit 5.258. And then if we go back to Mr Pankhurst's statement, which is ANZ.999.0001, <coughs> and then if we go to page.0075, Should I go to that? Or is that that might, it might assist you to have it in hard copy. Yes, it's page 75 of your statement, Thank Mr Pankhurst. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this is one of a number of tables that you very helpfully prepared in response to a request from the Commission for a table setting out the total amount of payments made by external responsible entities of managed investment schemes to an entity within the One Path or ANZ group where the payment takes into account investments of the assets of the superannuation fund? Uh, yes, that's one of the considerations, but takes into consideration other factors as well. And sorry, when you say that, what do you mean by that? It, it could take into consideration um, other consideration, uh, other factors at play. So, for example, when I look at these arrangements, I look at them as ultimately a wholesale pricing arrangement that we've been able to negotiate that may represent a, a range of factors in the way that we can then consider the cost inputs to our pricing model. Um, and so it's, it's one factor, you're correct, but there are, there are other things at play there. Well, you see the first item there is Schroeder Investment Management Australia Limited. That's correct. And the total amount paid by that fund manager back to some entity within perhaps multiple entities within the ANZ group was $2.28 million. That's I'm correct. I'm sorry, $2.228 million. That's correct. And that was for the year ending 30 September 2017? I believe, yeah, I believe that to be the case. And that's, are we right in understanding just the amount calculated by reference to investments of the assets of the One Path Master Fund? I, I would assume that to be the case, but yes, if that's in that table, that's, that's correct. And your point is that this is akin to a wholesale pricing arrangement, is that right? Yeah, so in, in, in the way that um, I would approach these, um, is effectively that when we look to provide a investment option on the platform, we would seek to do that by investing into that fund manager's wholesale managed investment scheme. We would have gone through a due diligence process which would be quite extensive with a, a number of managers, etc. And so we would then invest that money wholly into that, um, into that MIS on behalf of the members. And what that would mean is that they would be wholly invested at the price, the, the, the rack rate, if you like, or, the, or, or the, the market price of that fund. We would be then trying to see what we could do um, at our level to try and understand how we could reduce that price. And that would be to try and reduce the cost inputs, if you like, into the, the pricing model. So we have a range of inputs that go into the pricing model to effectively get to a position where we can then effectively price that product to make it competitive. And what these flows are, um, as I understand them and the way that, that, that 
that we approach them is effectively they are a, a rebate of the discount. If, if we were able to invest at that wholesale MIS rate, which is effectively um, the discount amount, and we were able to go into a separate MIS, then there would be no payment because you would be fixing that investment at that rate. So all this really does is reflect the negotiated discount uh, and, and, and the flows then, it goes back uh, into the, the, the entities as we've discussed. So that's, that's effectively what that is. Are you involved in negotiating these arrangements? Uh, teams of people from my area uh, are involved in that okay. specifically. Can we bring up ANZ.800.467.0007? Whilst that's coming up, how many of these arrangements are only able to continue to operate because they are protected by the grandfathering provisions under the Corporations Act? So um, we spend a lot of time on these from a legal perspective because there are, as you say, there are provisions and there are um, guidance and guidelines in, in regards to all of that. Our view is that um, from the extensive legal process that we've gone through, uh, that, that the, all the arrangements that we have are in place either fit a test that is pre-FOFA or post-FOFA. So, um, in effect, there are groupings of, of those within these arrangements. Give the doc ID again. It's ANZ.800.467.0007. So this is one of the master distribution agreements that ANZ has? That's the general cover sheet, yes. And what's blacked out there is which particular investment management entity it is? Sure. And if we go over the page to dot zero 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 eight, we see this is an agreement made on the 27th of January, 2011. That's correct. So it's a pre-FOFA agreement. That would, be, that would be right. And we can see that the parties to the agreement include One Path Custodians, the trustee. That's correct. One Path Funds Management Limited. That's correct. And One Path Life Limited? That's correct. I had understood from your statement that the payments don't get made back to One Path Custodians. Is that right? In this regard, that's correct. If we go to page triple zero nine, you see One Path is defined about two thirds of the way down the page to mean One Path Custodians and One Path Funds Management Limited. That's correct. And then if we go to page dot zero zero one two, See clause five, the shelf space fee. Oh, that's correct, yes, I can see that. And the issuer, that's the responsible entity for the external managed investment scheme or schemes. That would be right. And it is agreeing to pay one path the shelf space fee in respect of each of the issuer's schemes that are listed in the schedule to the agreement. That's what it appears to be, yes, correct. And if we go to page dot zero zero one five, we see what the Operator's obligations are that refers to one path, which we know as one path custodians or one path funds management, and it needs to comply with the law, but it doesn't seem to actually need to 
provide some sort of services to the issuer. That, that, that's what that appears to do, yes. And then if we go to page dot zero zero two five. This page here. So, again, the issuer and the particular percentage is redacted, but we can see that what's identified is a scheme of the issuer, which is going to be available through a number of the products issued by one path. That's 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 correct. And then, in exchange, it would seem for being available to be invested in through one of the one path products the issuer pays a percentage per annum of the funds under management to one path that's correct and so to take an example if an investor has invested through the retirement portfolio service invested their superannuation through the retirement portfolio service. That acts like a wrap platform. They have a menu of options that they can That's select. Correct. And they could, for example, select to go into the scheme of whatever, or one of the managed investment schemes of whatever this issuer is. Uh, that's correct. And whatever managed investment scheme they go into, they pay the rack rate investment fee charged by the external managed investment scheme? Uh, in RPS, I think um, I think generally, yes, for, for the brand new products, absolutely. I think that is true for the, um, yes, I think that's true for the, um, le the older products as well. And this rebate, that goes back to one path funds management or one path custodians or some entity within the ANZ group? In, in the master fund example, uh, that would go, the payment would be received by a bank account for one path funds management. And then that would be, there would be a journal entry that would then take that across into the one path life administrator account. And that's effectively where the products, fees and charges uh, are calculated and set at that level. And that's where that, that flow goes. But in the retirement service, I'm sorry, in the re retirement portfolio service, RPS, the money that's paid by the external responsible entity for the managed investment scheme, where does it go? Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit confused because of that document that that came my way this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I do apologise in that regard because it's sort of thrown me a little bit. Um, but to, to be honest, on that basis, I, I, I would have to say that I would, I would need to now understand a little bit more about that. For RPS, I, just to be clear, my, that's not my part of my portfolio. So I, would, I just need to get a little bit more information now on that. You're, you're not sure which entity within the ANZ <coughs> group receives it? Well, it certainly doesn't go through the funds management entity. So I'm assuming at this point that, that there would be a, a pay, that, that payment would go straight through to the OPC um, um, entity, if you like, in that regard, but I, I would need to, to confirm that. As, as I say, it's not part of my portfolio. But Is this, do you think, a flaw in the analogy with a negotiating wholesale rate, which is what happens through the retirement portfolio service is that the member pays to the external managed investment scheme the retail rate and the external managed investment scheme pays back to ANZ, but not to the member, the difference between the retail rate and the wholesale rate? Uh, n no, I don't. Um, you don't think that's what happens? No, no, I, 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 sorry. The premise of your question was, was I think you said, was there a flaw? Was, was yes. It, I, I actually don't think that's a flaw. 
and, and if I could give some context. Mm -hmm. Effectively, what we're doing here is we're trying to drive down the inputs, if you like, of the, of the costs uh, in setting a price. And, and I would imagine that in, within the RPS situation, that's exactly the same. So investment management is, is largely an, another cost input into the, into the, the model it's where we're trying to get ourselves above a hurdle rate, which is a, st a sustainable um, level that we need to meet. And then there are um, various other inputs costs that are associated with administration and custody and whatever else. And so at the product manufacturer level, what you're trying to do is reduce down those inputs. And, and, and that's being done in a way where effectively you're having a, a negotiation, but the negotiation is also with that particular fund manager because you have a range of different things that the organisation brings to that negotiation because it's large. Scale is a big, is a big influence and, and so effectively we, we do lots of things and we provide and have access to lots of things within the group that allows us to be able to achieve those, those, those economies of scale, if you like. And so what, what we do is we get that input and then that can help reduce what will be the cost ultimately within the, in the model so that the pricing can then be set separately and, and, and the aim is to be competitive and to price it competitively. So I, I don't think the model is flawed. Um, it's, it, it sounds like a com complicated and convoluted model. I, I appreciate that. In many cases now we set up a mandate arrangement where we simply manage a lot of that in the master trust. We simply manage that ourselves and we fix the price and there are no payments. So really this is, is, is probably an antiquated flow, if you like, of the way that a wholesale pricing negotiation actually physically pays that, that discount. Let's go back though to your analogy, which is a retail versus a wholesale price. Do we agree that the member invested through the retirement portfolio service pays the retail price to the external managed investment scheme for the investment management fee charged by that external managed investment scheme? As I understand it, uh, I believe that they would pay a, a wholesale arrangement price that we would have negotiated. I'm sorry, I, um, you're right to pick up on that because one of the other difficulties with this is external managed investment schemes will themselves offer a retail fund and a wholesale fund with a retail price and a wholesale price. Is that right? That's correct. And when you negotiate or when you put an external managed investment scheme onto one of your platforms, your superannuation platforms, you are putting on the wholesale fund. That's correct. And so it's the wholesale, wholesale fund investment, investment management fee will be lower than the retail yeah. managed investment scheme fee. That, that's generally the case, yes. The perhaps we will need to use a different way of putting it. The member of the retirement portfolio service who invests into an external managed investment scheme will typically pay the rack rate wholesale managed investment scheme fee. Um, they will, however, in the new grow wrap product, which is an RPS product, any negotiated discount would be passed back wholly to the customer. For members who aren't in the new product, they will pay the rack rate wholesale fee. They, they would pay a price that would include the wholesale rack rate with any other pricing discount factored into it, um, done separately, and then that would be whatever the outworking that would be passed through. So there would be an element of a discount or it could be that they, they may, as you say, invest um, at that rack rate. The issuer, assuming they're covered by one of these distribution agreements with you, will pay to you a rebate for every dollar that is invested with them through your retirement portfolio service they'll pay the rebate on the negotiated discount on the amount that's been invested with them. Yes, well, there's, yes, they'll pay the rebate to you, yeah. yes. It's only the, it's only the, dif 
the difference, if you yeah. like. You don't pass the rebate on to the member? Uh, in some cases, in, and as I just explained. Oh, I'm sorry, in, in the case of the new Oasis RAP platform. That's correct. You do pass it on? That's correct. For other members, you don't? Yeah, they're, they're in the pre fofa sort of arrangements, that, that's true. And do you say that that money that you don't pass on then has some effect on some other pricing decision you make? It's, it's an input into the pricing model. And so it becomes the cost to deliver the services that we, we go to. And it's, it's one of the variables that we use when we price a product. And by that you mean if we weren't receiving that money, we would still need to receive just, we would ultimately need to somehow raise just as much money in order to be able to hit, what, hit whatever our profit targets are. So then we would have to increase either the member's administration fee or the member's investment management fee. That's a possible outworking. You, you need to think of it in those terms, but ultimately you're trying to position the fund to be competitive because if you don't position the fund to be competitive and have a, an offering that the market would like, well then ultimately no one's going to invest in the fund and you're not going to actually receive um, any flows into that fund. So it needs to be, there's a multiple range of considerations and, and that's one of them. I tender that agreement, Commissioner. Master Distribution Agreement of 27 January uh, 2011, ANZ 800 467 0007, Exhibit 5.259. Commissioner, is that a convenient time? I'll be half an hour, I think, in the morning. Yes. If we're going to ask you, Mr Pankhurst, if you wouldn't mind uh, being back here in time to begin again at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Certainly, Commissioner. 9.30. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, Mr Pankhurst is continuing to give evidence. Yes. Would you mind coming back into the witness box, please, Mr Pankhurst? Do sit down. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Pankhurst, one of the other matters that you've given evidence about in your statement is ANZ's A to Z selling review. That's right. And ANZ has recently given an enforceable undertaking in relation to the use of or the sale of superannuation in connection with the A to, Z's, A to Z review. That's right. And were you involved in the negotiation of that enforceable undertaking? Uh, no, I wasn't. I was at the very end of the process as the, the product head was asked to just provide a, a standard sign-off on that. I see. But were you involved in the process of the development of the sale of superannuation together with the A to Z review? Uh, no, I wasn't. Was it somebody within your team who was responsible for doing that? Uh, no, no. Okay. It's somebody entirely different who's responsible for that? That's correct. Okay. So the evidence that you've given in relation to this is just based on information that you've obtained from other people? That's correct. Okay. Well, we'll do the best we can. Can you start by explaining to the Commissioner what the A to Z review is? It's uh, effectively a, a process where a customer will come into a, a branch and they will have a conversation with a banker, uh, a, a banker who's a, allowed and accredited to provide that um, service to customers, where they'll simply be um, looking at situations around their, their, what they currently own, what they currently owe, etc. Certain um, almost like a balance sheet conversation that they have about financial needs, primarily for the purpose of banking services. And so a customer comes in, they're not coming in to do an A to Z review? Uh, generally, my, my understanding is that a customer will come in, they'll, they'll come into a branch or they'll make an appointment to see a, to see a, a banker and, and, and they'll go and meet in a, a room and, and go through that process. Why do they think that they're coming into the branch? What is the product they're seeking to obtain? Oh, I would only be speculating on, on my own personal views, so I, I couldn't give you a definitive answer, but I assume that they've come to the bank for, for some sort of solution of some sort. So they do the review, and then once all of the questions 
are answered, then the banker suggests that they might be interested in superannuation? Um, as um, in, in the course of filling out the statement, it was explained to me that the, they go through a process that's largely driven by um, the banking solutions and, and, and primarily they go through that process. The banker then advises the customer that the uh, A to Z review has now finished uh, and then provides a what they call a delinking statement, which effectively says that, that, that the, any information or any further information that they provide about any other products and services is, is not going to take into consideration the information that they've provided. And if the customer is I then... Repeat that again. So, what, what's the proposition? So once the, once the um, uh, A to Z review is, is finished, the um, banker then will say to the say to the customer that, that, that it is completed and that they will if, um, provide them with a, uh, a, a delinking statement, if you like, which says that any other products or services that they may talk to them about will not include their, uh, the, the information that they have provided. And they will then ask the client, once they've done that, whether or not that customer is interested in understanding anything more about superannuation. Can we bring up Exhibit MP-215 to Mr Pankhurst's statement, which is ANZ.800.873.0025? So this is something that you've exhibited, Mr Pankhurst? Perhaps if we blow up the text of it. That's correct, that's the statement. That's the, if we blow it up, that's the delinking statement. That's correct. So, just so we can understand in context what the process is, if we put together paragraph 289 of your statement with this, the branch staff member will ask the customer questions about the customer's financial situation. That's correct and discuss the customer's goals and needs? I can't be certain about goals, goals and needs, but, I can, uh, but it'll be about their financial situation. If it helps you, you've deposed a paragraph 289 of your statement, an A to Z review is a process in which a branch staff member asks a customer questions about the customer's financial situation and has a discussion about the customer's goals and needs. Thank you, thank you. That's still your evidence? That's correct, thank you. And it involves, as you explain it, three steps. First, a discussion about the customer's current financial position, what they own, owe and spend. That's right. Second, discussing the customer's future goals. That's correct. And then third, the staff member identifies any retail banking products or services that could be relevant to the customer. That's correct. And is the delinking statement made between B and C? That is, is it made between discussing the customer's future goals and discussing with the customer an identification of retail banking products that might sue them, suit them? My understanding, it is made after any discussion of banking products. I see. So it will bank, the employee at the bank will go through these three steps, identify various banking products that the customer might be interested in, and then say, now that we've completed the A to Z review, would you like me to provide you with some general information on ANZ Smart Choice Super, which is designed to be a simple, low-cost way for customers to manage their superannuation? That is correct please be aware that I won't be able to use or reference any of the information you've already provided me when discussing this product with you. That's right. And that is intended to de-link the A to Z review from the offer of superannuation in what way? So it's effectively um, trying to be upfront with the client and say that if you're interested in talking to you about this other product, um, I can do that on a, a general information basis only, but I won't be able to take into consideration any of the, um, 
the goals needs information that you've told me previously. I see. And if we then go to the next exhibit to your statement, which is MP-216, which is ANZ.800.873.0001. Could you just explain to the Commissioner what this document is? I'm assuming um, I, would, I would need to refer to the next page to be completely clear if that is at all possible. Yes, can we bring up page dot triple zero two? I believe that, I believe that this is a, is a, uh, a document, it's a, a general advice warning that the staff member, the, the ANZ banker, um, would read out aloud to the customer. I believe that may be the case. Um, I'm just trying to remember exactly, but I believe that may be, be the case. I understand. So it goes like this. They do the A to Z review, then they make the delinking statement. Then if the customer says anything to indicate they might be interested in the superannuation product, then the bank, star bank branch staff member will say, please note I can only provide general advice on this product, so you need to consider if it's right for you. That's correct. I see. And this process was regarded by ANZ as being the provision of general advice only and not personal financial advice? That is correct. And ASIC's position ultimately became that because it was linked up to the A to Z review, it was akin to personal financial advice? Um, my understanding was that ASIC's perspective on this was that it was the proximity of the customer being taken through an A to Z review and then being, despite the delinking statement and then despite this uh, general advice warning, it was actually the proximity between those that was the problem in this situation. Does ANZ regard what is being provided by the bank branch staff member to the customer as advice? In, in which situation? Do you mean the A to Z review or do you mean in the general um, PC? Well, let's take them in turn. Does it regard the A to Z review as the provision of advice? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on, on that particular piece. But in terms of the um, in terms of the discussion around smart choice, that would be the the view was that that's a general general product advice or scripted general advice. What does advice mean, though, in this context? In this situation, it's really just talking about a product and its features, and what it costs and how it works, really. Do you think it's misleading to even call it advice? My personal view is it's, 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 a challenging, it's, it's, it's a challenging topic because you're trying to just give information and you're needing to do it within a legal framework. And so the general advice rules is what you're trying to play within and trying to make sure that you're not misleading the customer, you're not giving them anything that's advice, you're just simply telling them this is what the product does and that's effectively what it is. And uh, it, it, it's, I think that's the intention here was simply to, to just make people aware of what the product did. It must be a bit more than that though, isn't it? It's not just telling people about the product, ANZ wants people to take the product up. Oh, that's correct, yes. So it's doing something with the aim of causing people to enter into the product? It's, it's making them aware of it. They've indicated to get to that point that they would be interested in that type of a product. And so they are offering that information. But you are, you're right that the, ultimately the bank's looking to, to open those kinds of accounts for- It's trying to customer. sell something to the that, customer. That's correct, that's correct. And it's indifferent, isn't it, as to whether or not this particular product is in the best interests of the customer? The, the 
product is a one of those set and forget products which effectively any of the information that you've been provided um, will largely be irrelevant because it's a life stage based product. It's simply a, whatever your age is really determines what the product will be in terms of both the investment and, and in terms of what the insurance will be. So it's actually even the information that you've provided that's not going to change anything within the product. It's, it, it's, it's a one size sort of fits all depending upon your age. So I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by indifferent, but, but ultimately it's the, the conversation prior and the information prior is not going to have any, out, any impact on the outcome. I mean it's indifferent in this sense, that it does not care whether or not a customer coming into the ANZ branch would be better off in a superannuation product offered by a different entity compared with the ANZ product? Uh, this particular process is not comparing other products, that's correct. And it doesn't, it, I, I just want to make sure we agree with each other. ANZ is selling this product it is indifferent as to whether or not this product is in the best interests of the people who might take it up. It, 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 it's, it's indifferent, I, I, that's not a word that I'm comfortable with. It, it's effectively just saying if you have a need for a product, this is the product that we have. Um, it's not going through a, a full needs analysis. It's not going through an analysis. If the customer was, and, and part of the process was if they had identified that the customer wanted to go through full financial planning advice, then that, that, that um, banker could refer that person to a full financial planner and in that situation the financial planner could go through that process. This is simply saying this is a product, this is what we have and this is what it does. It's up to you to make a decision if you wish to, to invest in that product. Can we bring up ASIC.0041.0002.8478? <coughs> Actually, I'm sorry, just before we go to that document, I might get you to have a look at a different document, which is the agreement between the trustee and ANZ. So could we bring up ANZ.800.778.0001? So this is a deed of amendment to the services deed between ANZ and One Path Custodians? That's correct. And One Path Custodians is the trustee in respect of the ANZ Smart Choice product? Ah, uh, yes. Was the ANZ Smart Choice product established specifically for the purpose of being sold in ANZ branches? I, d I don't know specifically. I, I can't answer that accurately. Was it intended that its customers, that its customer base come from somewhere other than ANZ selling the product through its distribution network? Again, I'd be speculating, but I assume that it was primarily built for distribution through ANZ, but it could be available through other, other channels, online channels, etc. If we go to page triple zero two, <coughs> so we see this is the effectively the front part of the deed, and it's dated the third of August two thousand and twelve. If you look under background subparagraph B. One Path Custodians established a new online superannuation product known as ANZ Smart Choice. That's right. And then subparagraph C says ANZ Smart Choice is a direct superannuation transition to retirement and pension product manufactured by One Path Custodians and distributed through ANZ's retail bank distribution channels. Yes. So that seems to suggest it's set up 
for the purpose of them being distributed through the bank. Uh, that's what that says, that's correct. But you're making the point the distribution channels might not be limited to through a branch, it might also be online sales. Uh, and it's, it's possible, and, and, and I'm, it's, it's possible that there could be a, another advice group, et cetera, or there could be another provider at some point that may wish to offer that product at some point, but this is saying that it was primarily developed for the banking channel, so I would agree. And in terms of your responsibility or role in this, do you come in at the point where one path custodians is manufacturing the product? I, I personally look after the product that, and, and, and have, have done so since about 2015. So. I see. It had already been started up before you took That's it correct. on your current role. That's right. So your role is not in relation to anything to do with the selling. Your role is just in relation to the manufacturing operation of the product. That's correct. And how has the product performed net of investment, net of administration fees over the last few years? Uh, it's against its 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 peers. Um, look, I, I think we would like we always like. Um, improved returns. I think we would always like better returns. I think if it's in, in certain life stage cohorts, it's been good. Um, in some of the more conservative ones, we've uh, not been as happy and we've, we've done some, we've, we've made some changes to it to, to sort of change it. It's, it's got some quite conservative aspects to it. And so we've, we've been looking at the strategic asset allocation and those sorts of things. So I think there's always work to do to make sure that these things are delivering for customers. Is, it, is this a fair summary of what you're saying, that overall you are not happy with the performance to date of the product? I have been in certain times, but I, I, and there, there, has been, there has been times where I have been very happy with it, and, and versus its sort of core peers, it's done quite well. Um, it's a very large market that we're in, and so we want to make sure that it's... it's uh, it's competitive, and I, and I, I guess you, ne you never get happy. You, you always want this to, to perform better. It's not a my super product, is it? No, it's not. And do you know whether at some stage ASIC was also concerned about whether people might think it was a my super product? Uh, I believe that there was. Yes, yes, I think there was a there was an error that we had made in a in a, in a website or a publication that it put the wrong product label um, it, on, on, on a video or, or something like that. It's confusing because there is more than one ANZ Smart Choice product. That is correct. And there is an ANZ Smart Choice product that is a My Super product. Th that's right. One's called Super and Pension and one's called um, Smart Choice for employers and their employees. That is correct. And there's then another ANZ Smart Choice product, which is the one being sold through the branches, which is not a My Super product. S sorry, they're the two that I was talking about. The, yes. the, the Super and Pensions through the branches. The one through the branches. And the, the and employer, employer product's one. My Super offering. And are they managed in different ways? Are they kept separate? Uh, we manage them within the same same teams, and we manage them as a uh, as 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 a core, effectively, and and. They're very, very similar. However, the, the employer offering provides more functionality. Largely, it's a one being a my super offering, but it also caters for the needs of of employers, with contribution capabilities, and all sorts of different other things. But fundamentally, they're very similar. Is the attribution investments between them the same? Yes. So it's just the same investments. That's correct. Are the fees the same? Yes. All right, so it's not a my super product, but it's the same as the my super product. It, yes, it is, but there's more. There's, in the my super product, has more investment options and it's some different insurances and those sorts of things. But the, the core of it is is the same. And then, if we go to page dot zero zero two eight. These are the services that are to be provided by ANZ to the trustee. That, that looks like the schedule. And if we go over the page to page.0028,
I'm sorry, 29. We see what was one of the services which was originally contracted under section 1.3 was that wealth accredited ANZ branch staff would provide customers with ANZ smart choice product information using scripted general advice protocols within the A to Z review process. This, this, I see that, that, that this was a surprise. It was a surprise. This was a surprise to me, yep. To you? Yes. When did it take you by surprise? Well, when we were doing the, when we were preparing the witness statement, there, there was, in, in my, um, in preparing of the witness statement and, and referring to other people, it was, um, it had never been explained anywhere and, and it was not clear to, to people that, that, that it had ever been within the A to Z review process. It had always been after the A to Z review process. Oh, I see. But in any event, One Path Custodians had contracted to have ANZ offer the smart choice product to customers who came into branches originally within the A to Z process and then subsequently it's amended to say after the A to Z process. It, it was amended. It, it was a surprise, as I said. In I wonder whether that was a drafting error, I'm not sure, but you're right, it was amended. If it was an error, it persisted until an amendment to the deed in 2016. That, that's right, there was an amendment. That's Two right. years after ASIC started raising an issue about it. I, 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 all I can say is that there was an amendment and you, that's roughly about the time frame. And how does ANZ get remunerated for providing this service? I, I don't know. I don't. I'm not aware. Is there a revenue sharing arrangement in relation to the Smart Choice product? I, I'm, I'm not aware. I'm sorry. I don't know. When you manufacture and operate the product, do you know how much money from the fees that come in from the product goes back to the ANZ group? I, I, only through the the um, One Path Life, uh, there's, I'm not aware of any, personally I'm not aware of any other. I'm sorry, only through the uh, what? Only through the, the fees that we charge for the customer. Yes. That we, we, we charge, and, and that, as far as I'm aware, is the only revenue amount that would be, um, that the bank as an entity would be receiving on this. I'm, I'm not aware of anything else. You think it would only be by a dividend paid back by the holding, or by one path custodians back to the ANZ group? Just in the, in the, in the normal way that we operate as a, as a business, yes. I, I, yeah, yes. I think what you're saying is you don't think there's any specific money that flows back to ANZ in relation to this service? I, I, I don't believe that's, I, I don't believe so. ANZ just receives whatever money it receives under every other arrangement it has with the custodian. That's right, as I, as I understand it. And by bringing in more customers into the superannuation product, that increases the amount of money flowing through those other doors back to ANZ. It's, it's, it's seen as wealth is a, a core need of customers and a lot of the research that we've done indicates that customers with a, a wealth solution tend to, to be stay with the bank longer and they tend to be more satisfied, it's seen as a, a way to deliver a more holistic approach to, 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 to retaining and growing the client base. And how successful was the selling of the super product through the branches? I, I th it depends on, you, on, on what you define as being successful. Um, a lot of, whilst clients took out the product, they, they did not have to invest in the product. Um, and roughly around 47% of customers that have actually opened an account have actually invested into that product. Um, and it's, so it, it really depends on, on, on your, your definition of success. What's the value of the funds under management that has flowed from the branch selling? Uh, I don't, I, I, may, I'm, I may have included that in my second witness statement, is, is that, uh, there were some additional numbers that were provided. Um, 
So if I could just refer to the, the second statement. Yes, if you go to, is this what you're thinking about, your table on page two of your supplementary statement? I'm sorry, I don't have a doc ID for the supplementary statement. Yes, it's on page two. I believe that might answer your question. Yes, is the answer to my question that from when the branch in branch distribution model started in 2012 through to 31 May 2016, the value of contributions or rollovers into the product was a little over two billion dollars. That, that's that's, and presumably there are more. There's more money that continues to flow in from those customers. That's right. This particular product has about three point six billion in total. And is that regarded by ANZ as a successful implementation of the branch selling model? I, I, I would say that we believe that the product is, it's a long term it was, it was designed as a long-term super savings vehicle with a long-term perspective. I think it's, it's probably on its way to achieving its targets at this stage, but it's, it's not there yet. But these are, these are long-term investments when you build products like this. They take some time. Do you agree that the key risk in relation to the sale of Smart Choice Super is that customers will switch their superannuation without understanding the potential consequences and end up with a less suitable product than their existing funds? I wouldn't, no, no, I wouldn't say that with this product. I think that is a general risk with all superannuation products that customers um, make decisions without fully understanding exactly what they're, they're in. Let me show you a document. This is ASIC.0041.0002.8478. So this seems to be an internal presentation of ANZ concerned with the sale of wealth products via the retail distribution method. Have you seen this document before? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. And you see it's said to be a product of Australia Division Compliance? That's correct. Where does compliance sit? Uh, that uh, Australia Division is, is a different division than the Wealth Division. It's separate from, from Wealth. So I'm assuming it is the, the risk and compliance teams that sit within the, in the sort of Australia banking, retail banking business. But within the wealth business? No, this is separate. Oh, outside of the That's wealth correct. business? Yes. Okay. And you don't know whether it's a presentation to wealth or to somebody else? I, I, no, I don't, sorry. If we go to page.8482. We see what risk thought was the nature of the mis-selling risk, and you see what's said there, the key risk that the sale of Smart Choice Super presents is that customers switch their superannuation without understanding the potential consequences and end up with a less suitable product than their existing funds. I do, I see that. And just so I understand, do you agree or disagree with that statement? I would agree with that statement. And then you see there's a table that begins, and do you see the first box in the top left corner is suitability assessment? Uh, yes. And it's explained there, staff can only provide general advice about smart choice and cannot make any assessment of the product suitability for the customer or comparisons with their existing funds. Yes. It is therefore essential that customers understand that staff are not making any recommendation about the product 
and they that they must decide for themselves if it is right for them. That's correct. And this then I take it is the idea of the delinking statement and the general advice warning that customers will understand the bank isn't actually recommending this product for them. It's just telling them about it. That's correct. I see. And then if we go over the page to dot eight four eight three, we see the box sales process and the driver that's identified there is there is a potential conflict between the personalised advice A to Z review process and the scripted general advice smart choice sales process. See that? And there's an explanation of the type of issue that we've been talking about already, which is if you go through and talk with a customer about their needs and provide recommendations to a customer about banking products based on their needs, then they're going to think that you're thinking about their needs and making a recommendation to them based on their needs when you start telling them about a super product. That's, that's right, that's what that says. And then the way in which ANZ proposed to attempt to mitigate that risk was by what we've talked about already, which is they call it the linking statement, I think. You call it the delinking statement. The last thing you want is to link it any further. Yeah, it's de yeah, to dealing from that conversation, from that process. And the general advice warning is the other part of That's correct. This. That's right. And the general advice is actually really supposed to be a statement, which is this isn't advice at all. It's just a selling to you of a product. It's just here, here are the facts. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Before we do that, is the deed of amendment in oh, otherwise? No, Commissioner, I tend to that document as well. The deed of amendment to the services deed between ANZ and One Path Custodians, 3 August 2012, ANZ 800-778-0001 is Exhibit 5.261. The uh, 5.260, I should say. Um, the sale of wealth products via retail distribution September 13, ASIC 0041 0002 8478 is Exhibit 5.261. Now, I'll show you another document. We'll see if you've seen this, Mr. Pankhurst. This is ANZ.81, I'm sorry, ANZ.801.096.0002. So this again seems to be an internal document prepared, it would seem, by the Chief Risk Officer for presentation to the Managing Director of Distribution or perhaps the other way around. Uh, You're not sure? I'm not sure. And you haven't seen the document before? I, I, I saw it in the last couple of days. I see. In the course of preparing the course of evidence. preparing I saw this. And we can see this is a document as at the 30th of September 2011. That's correct. And if we go over the page to dot triple zero three, <coughs> this is a discussion about the use of the retail distribution network in relation to distributing wealth products. That's what is that it right? used to be. And you probably need to speak up. I'm sorry, Mr. Pangos. I'm sorry, that's, you're right. And we see about a third of the way down the page, a key strategic pillar for ANZ is to improve its wealth penetration, distribution of tier one products through the Australian branch network and ANZ Direct, and ANZ Direct is a key component of this strategy. Current proposal is to use a scripted general advice model for tier one wealth products to be distributed by retail distribution. I, I can see that. Is the smart choice super product a tier one wealth product? Yes. But it wouldn't have been developed or at least the development of it wouldn't have been completed by this time. This is 2011. Um, or you're not sure? I'm not sure. It may, it may have actually been built before that time. It, it's around that time, but it may have been built by that time. 
And then if we go over the page to, I'm sorry, actually, before we do that, we should go back and just note exactly what's being identified as the risk description. You see that section which said is risks can be summarised as follows. Failure by branch network and ANZ Direct to ensure only scripted general advice is provided to customers in general advice situations. Failure by staff to provide general advice warning to customers and fail to maintain appropriate records of advice and warning. Staff do not follow the correct sales process, including the proper utilisation of the A to Z review and not handing over required documents such as the PDS, FSG or explaining the relevant features. I and then this. there's a couple of other risks as well. I see this. Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot triple zero four. We see the inherent risk rating is described as extreme. Yes. And then the residual risk rating, the current residual risk rating is high. Yes. And then there's an explanation as to what that residual risk rationale is, which is it is possible that regular breaches <coughs> of incidents would be seen by the regular regulator as systemic, putting ANZ's licence at risk. Would you point... I'm sorry. I, I you see in the middle of the page residual risk rationale. It is possible that regular breaches of incidents would be seen by the regulator as systemic, putting ANZ's licence at risk. Yes. And then there's an explanation of what the current risk controls are, which are said to be limited to detective measures such as mystery shopping, compliance spot checks and customer surveys. That's correct. And then there's a residual risk rating after treatment where the risk rating will drop to medium. And there's an explanation that the reason for that change is the risk analysis and mitigation program for this emerging risk will require ongoing review post initial rollout. That's, that's wrong. And there were going to be further controls that were implemented. That's correct. And do you know whether the further controls were implemented or not? Uh, I'm not completely sure. In any event, whatever the situation with the controls, there was mystery shopping that was done in relation to the sale of the Smart Choice product. That's correct. When it was accompanied by the A to Z review. Uh, that is correct. And those mystery shopping explorations identified problems with the sales? Uh, I think what the mystery shopping identified, and I believe that I've got the results in the second witness statement, um, that there were instances where um, a small number of customers who had been mystery shopped or the mystery shopping customers had come through and that there was a small number of customers that had um, gone through that process and where a delinking statement had not been read out to them um, or the general advice and warning. And then once that was identified, then that was taken up, as I understand it, with that particular staff member and they were retrained and, and that was taken off. The mystery shopping was checking whether or not the process was all followed? Yeah, as I understand it, the, the mystery shopping, the person came in, they were, they were effectively being a customer. They were going through the process and they had a range of criteria that they needed to assess uh, from a compliance perspective. The mystery shopping couldn't tell you whether the ordinary customer who came in actually understood that there was this concrete wall that ANZ was apparently drawing between on the one hand or apparently building between on the one hand the A to Z review and the selling of bank products and the selling of superannuation on the other hand. I, I don't believe that. I think that would be a subjective measure, but no. And I tend to that document, Commissioner. Retail Distribution Advisory Risk, Australia Division CRO, 30 September 2011, ANZ 8010960002, Exhibit 5.262. Now, I'll then show you another document again. I suspect you're going to tell us you haven't seen this. Can we bring up ANZ.801.096.0013?
this is another internal presentation in relation <coughs> to advice and distribution risk. You'll see this one is dated July 2011. I see that. Have you looked at this document before? I saw it in the last two days okay. on the preparation. What I'm interested in is if we go to page dot zero zero three one. This is setting out an internal account of an engagement with ASIC. That's how I read it. And it explains in the first point, Wealth engaged ASIC in 2009 to examine advice proposals to distribute the online investment account in branches. That's what it says, correct? Yes. And you don't know whether that occurred or not? I, I, you would I assume it did. I, I, I'm taking the document to But assume. no one has told you about it? No, no they haven't. And then in the last bullet point, in response to ANZ's concerns with SGA, Scripted general advice. Scripted general advice, thank you. ASIC indicated, one, the ability to provide general advice was not compromised by prior awareness or concurrent completion of a customer fact find process. The crucial factor was the absence of a personal recommendation as to the suitability of or to acquire a product. I see that. And what I'm interested in is whether you were aware that ASIC had at some time in the past okayed the use of a fact find process like the A to Z review concurrently in relation to the sale of a product? I, I, I was not personally aware. All right, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Wealth risk mass market, wealth Australian distribution, advice and distribution risk, July 2011, ANZ 8010960013, exhibit 5.263. Has there been any consideration given Mr Pankhurst to how many, if any, of the customers who signed up and made contributions or rollovers into the Smart Choice product were worse off as a result of doing that rather than sticking with their existing superannuation fund? Uh, I don't believe so. I don't have any further questions for this witness, Commissioner. Thank you. No yes. re-examination. Might he be excused, Commissioner? Yes, thank you, Mr Pankhurst. You may step down and you're excused. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Allett from AMP. So perhaps if we could break for five minutes to I come back when 25 past. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.